Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started. So I've muted everybody and we will have an opportunity later in the program where you will be able to unmute and ask questions and feel free to write your questions down and later on what you can put them in the chat. But for now, let's keep the chat clear so that people can concentrate on the excellent content that you're about to hear. I am pleased to uh, welcome you to this book celebration for a new book called Jewish Languages from A to Z or A to Z, depending on where you are. And it's by Aaron Rubin and Lily Kahn who are with us today. Uh, we are going to be hearing a presentation about the book and seeing some images and then I'll be interviewing the authors of the book and then we'll have a chance to have uh, a conversation about it with some Q&A. Um, my name is Sarah Bunin Benor and I am director of the Jewish Language Project from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion out of Los Angeles in the United States. And we have the two authors of the book here, Aaron Rubin and Lily Kahn. And I'm going to ask them to just introduce themselves briefly so you can find out about their affiliations. And then they are going to begin their presentation. Please. Lily? Do you want to go first? <laughs> OK. My name is, is Aaron Rubin. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, Penn State University, um, and I um, am a Semitist by training, uh, but the last five, eight years or so, I've been very interested in the field of Jewish languages, and um, I hope that I interest some of you in that field as well today. And I'm Lily Khan, and I'm a professor of Hebrew and Jewish languages in the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at UCL. And my research background has primarily been on uh, Hebrew in Eastern Europe and Yiddish. Um, and um, thanks to, um, uh, to Aaron, um, who invited me to collaborate on an edited volume that I'll talk about in a minute, I got into Jewish languages more broadly. Um, and, and so have also been working on that. We've been working on that together um, for about the past um, seven or so years together. So um, shall I just go straight into the presentation? Okay, so um, let me just see if I can get it to, okay. So on mine, it's kind of showing up. It's like not showing the whole um, slide. Can everyone else see the whole slide? Does it look normal to you? Yes, it does to me. You can do view options to make Yeah, it let me see. I've never had this happen before. OK, I think that's better. So we're going to give you a little bit of an overview of our new book, Jewish Languages from A to Z or A to Z. And we first wanted to give you a little bit of background about how this book came about. So. Um, as I mentioned, in 2016, um, Aaron and I published a co-edited volume. Uh, someone saying the volume they can't hear? It's okay? All right, great. <laughs> so um, Aaron and I published a co-edited volume um, called The Handbook of Jewish Languages, which was published by Brill. And that book was designed primarily for an academic um, audience of linguists, and it was meant to kind of introduce um, scholars, particularly to the really exciting and diverse world of Jewish languages of the diaspora. And while we were working on that book, which was, you know, great because it um, allowed us to collaborate with all kinds of um, academics all over the world working on um, different Jewish languages, it really like kind of inspired us because there was so much fascinating material and we wanted to um, like kind of work on another book project that would um, sort of introduce some of that material to a broader audience. Um, and that was how the idea for this book was born. Um, we wanted to also like kind of have a chance um, to look at more languages in more depth and um, to kind of explore some of the languages that are not necessarily 
um, kind of at the top of the list when you think of um, a Jewish language, most people think of Yiddish and you know, Ladino or Judeo-Spanish and Judeo-Arabic and Aramaic. Um, there were also a lot of other languages covered in the handbook around 25, but we wanted to include even more because there's so many other languages and language varieties that have a really fascinating story to tell. So um, if we could go to the next slide, we'll show you um, what we have in mind. So this um, list shows you all of the different languages that are addressed in our book. Either they have their own chapter, um, some of them have more than one chapter, like for example, um, Yiddish has three chapters, um, Hebrew has a few chapters, um, Arabic and Aramaic each have two chapters, um, and some of them are only mentioned in another, in another chapter because um, they're, um, either they're, their story is very similar to the story of another Jewish language variety that is told in more depth, um, or because there isn't a lot of information that um, um, that we could um, present. But basically, this is a huge variety of languages, as you can see. And the reason that we wanted to be so comprehensive is because we really wanted to um, just kind of introduce people to all of the different ways that um, Jews have interacted with um, the co-territorial languages of the places that they've lived in over the centuries and over the millennia. So um, in the book, the book is, is organized in alphabetical order um, from A to Z. Um, and so you can see there's, um, there's a chapter on Amharic, which is um, a language variety that was um, spoken by uh, Jews in Ethiopia and has actually really kind of blossomed into um, a more distinctive Jewish variety in Israel. Um, so this is an example of a newer language variety that has kind of like taken on some more um, sort of specifically Jewish characteristics like um, incorporation of, um, of um, Hebrew vocabulary and, and some entry, other interesting features in recent years. Um, then we have languages like Arabic um, and Aramaic, which have a very, very long pedigree as a Jewish language and um, you know, have quite substantial corpora of texts um, and are written in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and, you, and you can see if you look through the list that there, you know, there's some languages that are confined to the medieval period, like um, Judeo-French, although there might now be a, a kind of um, 21st century, like Jewish French variety um, emerging. But what we focus on is the is the medieval um, corpus of texts um, to languages like um, Malay, where um, this is not conventionally thought of as a Jewish language. Um, it's not traditionally written in the Hebrew script. There wasn't a big, um, you know, kind of population of Malay speaking Jews, but it can tell us a really fascinating story about um, about Jewish history and Jewish life, um, because we um, we find this of a, a notebook that was written um, around the turn of the 20th century, around um, 1900 by um, an Indian Jewish merchant. Um, and it's like a little notebook with what looks like a phrase book in Malay written in Hebrew characters, um, suggesting that he might have traveled to Malaysia or wanted to speak with, um, with Malay speaking um, business associates maybe. Um, and then we have all kinds of, um, of other languages that are kind of everywhere on the spectrum from, um, you know, kind of the, like Judeo-Arabic or Yiddish type, um, where there's a very long written history to languages that were more oral in character and weren't usually written down, or when they were written down, they weren't written in the Hebrew script. Um, and even languages like um, Esperanto, which might raise an eyebrow, and you might think, well, how is that a Jewish language if it's an artificial language? But we'll talk more about that later. Um, so we essentially just really kind of wanted to introduce people to all of the um, really kind of fascinating aspects of Jewish linguistic diversity. Um, and like another interesting thing about these languages is that often um, we really can only learn about sort of Jewish history through the Jewish languages themselves. Like, so for example, um, Jews were involved in the medieval period in Central and Eastern Europe in, in coin minting. And we know this in large part because there are Czech and Polish coins um, from the medieval period with Hebrew script. Um, so there, like kind of, there are really a lot of reasons why Jewish languages are interesting beyond just the interesting um, facts about the languages themselves. So Aaron, can I, shall I uh, hand over to you? Sure. sure, I'd like to point out always um, that Jewish languages aren't just historical curiosities, but rather they 
are often of real academic value, whether to linguistics or history or literature or music or one of several other fields. And when it comes to linguistics, Jewish languages have a lot to offer both linguistics in general, whether historical or sociolinguistics, and this is also to the study of the history of individual languages. For example, um, Judeo-Persian texts from the eighth century discovered along the Silk Road in China provide the earliest evidence of the new Persian language predating um, Persian texts in Arabic script. And this makes these Judeo-Persian texts important for the study of the history of the Persian language. And some of the earliest Czech was written in Hebrew characters by medieval Jews living in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Papiamentu is a Creole language that is spoken in the Caribbean and Sephardic Jews played a very important role in the development of that language. And the earliest surviving text in Papiamentu is actually a love letter written by a Jew on the island of Curaçao in 1775. Um, Judeo-French texts from the 12th to 14th centuries contain hundreds and hundreds of old French words that are not attested in contemporary texts written by Christians, make French very important for the study of uh, French lexical history. Um, many of these Judeo-French words, by the way, are found in the commentaries of uh, Rashi, the, the most famous of the medieval, um, biblical and, and Talmudic uh, um, scholars. Um, likewise, um, Judeo-Italian, um, sometimes can uh, shed light on the early history of words in Italian. And one fun example that, I, uh, that we teased in our advertisement comes from a 14th century glossary. And the image that's on the slide is from uh, a glossary of um, difficult words in Maimonides' Torah. And uh, there are, it's a list of words with uh, uh, Hebrew words with glosses in uh, Judeo-Italian. There's Italian written in Hebrew characters. And in the fifth line of this image, you can see, if you can see my pointer here, uh, the Hebrew word uh, uh, which is a, a word that means something, something like a kind of cake or um, some kind of baked dough. The gloss you can read pretty clearly here is pizza. Now the first attestation of the word pizza in an Italian text is from the mid 1500s, which is nearly 200 years after uh, this manuscript, um, this glossary, which means that um, the earliest attestation of the word pizza in, uh, in Italian, any kind of Italian comes from this Jewish text in Hebrew characters. Not a, uh, an amazing um, linguistic find, but a still a fun cultural uh, tidbit there. And I'll move on next, Lily, to Judeo-Chinese. Okay, so one of the, I think, um, really exciting um, aspects of getting to work on Jewish languages is just um, getting to see how, um, you know, kind of diverse Jewish life has been globally. And a lot of us know that, but it's really interesting to see how it comes together in the form of text that might not be kind of totally expected. So, um, as I think many people know that the Jews um, settled in Kaifeng, which was the capital of China um, in the medieval period. Um, and they, they probably came from a Judeo-Persian uh, speaking area. They were originally Persian speaking, um, but th at some point they adopted Chinese, although they maintained Hebrew for things like um, reading the Torah and liturgy. Um, but they were very well um, accepted. They were welcomed into um, Kaifeng society and into Chinese society more generally. And so they really kind of, you know, acculturated, took on Chinese surnames um, and over the, you know, the course of the centuries, like kind of became very, very well um, embedded in, in Chinese culture. And you can kind of see this reflected in the image on the right, which is a bilingual memorial book that was written in Hebrew and Chinese. And it was completed sometime around the middle of the 17th century. Um, one of the, like kind of the uh, tragedies about the Kaifeng Jewish community is that a lot of their uh, documents, um, along with the, the the synagogue and you know kind of other records of communal life, there were um, destroyed on two occasions by um, terrible floods um, on the Yellow River. And so we're lucky that some of the um, some of the manuscripts survived, and this is one of them. So this this manuscript records the names of more than seven hundred community members, like kind of going back over um, several generations. And the and the really cool thing about it is that, um, as you can see, it's a mix of Chinese characters and Hebrew script. So you can see, um, you have first names like um, like Israel, um, Eliezer, Yosef, 
um, Aaron written in Hebrew script. Um, and then you also have um, the Chinese surnames, which appear like kind of right next to, so you see Bat, Reb Yehuda, and then a Chinese surname. And also, um, even, even more exciting is that um, some Chinese first names, especially of women, were written in the Hebrew script. Um, so for example, um, you have this, which, which has been uh, transcribed here, Jin Shi Da Jie Ba Jin Fu. So it's Miss, Miss Jin, the elder sister, daughter of Jin Fu. Um, and that, um, so Jin Shi Ba Jin Fu, is, is here, if you can read the Hebrew script, you can see that this is Jin Shi, and so you get this very nice phonetic Hebrew script rendition of a Chinese name. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the um, really exciting thing, uh, things about working with Jewish languages is you get these sort of, you know, um, possibly unexpected, um, delightful examples of how versatile the Hebrew script was. Um, you know, like any script, it could be used to write any language in the world, and this is a nice illustration of that. Um, as well as giving us some insight into a, you know, kind of lesser known, um, but very thriving Jewish community. Aaron, should we go on to the next one? Sure. So I tried to make the point uh, a few minutes ago that languages and Jewish language texts um, should be of great interest to linguists. But um, as, uh, as Lily explained, the texts themselves very often teach us a lot about the communities um, that wrote these texts like with this uh, Judeo-Chinese manuscript. And I'll give just one more example of another non-linguistic gem that we can find within the corpora of Jude uh, Jewish language texts. Um, there exists a Sidor, a prayer book from the 15th century written almost entirely in Judeo-Provençal. That is Provençal, um, the language of uh, Southern France uh, written in the Hebrew alphabet. And this particular Sidor is um, or was made specifically for a woman. And we know this because there's a dedication on the first page um, that says uh, in Hebrew, uh, my sister, may you be, or may you become uh, thousands of myriads, the, the, the phrase that uh, the blessing that Rebecca's family uh, gives to her is 2460. Uh, so we know this, this door was made for a woman. Uh, and uh, most uh, or many, uh, vernacular prayer books were made uh, for women uh, since traditionally men were better educated in Hebrew. We know, for example, or many of you know that um, some early literature was made uh, specifically for women. Um, anyway, uh, within this prayer book, we find a very interesting variant of uh, one of the uh, morning prayers. Um, a traditional Orthodox uh, Hebrew Sidor has a prayer uh, saying, uh, blessed is the Lord who has not made me a woman, Asani uh, Isha. And women traditionally have said in place of this uh, blessing, um, as you can see here on the left hand uh, of your screen, Asani uh, um, uh, who has made me according to his will. But in this Judeo-Provençal Sidor, we find uh, instead a blessing that says, uh, or thanking God, uh, who has made me a woman. Uh, and this uh, particular uh, blessing is almost unique in Jewish history. Um, there are just two uh, Hebrew sidurim from uh, the late 15th century, both found in Italy, that have uh, a phrasing similar to this Provençal sidur. So basically we have in this 15th century sidur from Southern France, uh, perhaps the earliest example of what we might call a feminist prayer book. Um, something uh, totally, almost totally unique uh, in Jewish history until very recently. Lily? And finally, as promised, Esperanto. So as I think most people know, Esperanto is an artificial language um, and it was created by uh, Ludwig Leiser um, Zamenhof, who was born Eliezer Levi Zamenhof. And this might give you a clue as to why we're including it in a book on Jewish languages. Um, so there are a few different reasons why we wanted to include Esperanto. Um, one is that um, beyond the fact that, um, that its creator was a Jew, um, Zamenhof actually has a, um, you know, kind of a, a very um, closely linked history to work on Jewish languages. So he himself was a native speaker of Yiddish um, from Bialystok, which was in the Russian empire at that point. And it was a very multilingual environment. 
where um, apart from his native Yiddish, he also was exposed to Polish and Russian and Belarusian, you know, just from kind of surrounding society. And he was educated in Hebrew, um, as well as studying French, German, Latin, and Greek. So this background not only gave him an interest in linguistic matters, but it also um, kind of somehow contributed to the way that he viewed the experience of anti-Semitism, pogroms, and in general, ethnic tension. They kind of shaped his worldview and, it, and, and kind of led him down a really interesting track where, um, first, of, first of all, he became um, interested in Yiddish. Um, he wrote a grammar of Yiddish, and he was also interested in the revernacularization of Hebrew. So he, he kind of had a very similar trajectory to a lot of other um, Eastern European Jews of this period, many of whom either ended up becoming Yiddishists um, or who, and, and others who, who became um, early Zionists and, um, you know, kind of started promoting the revernacularization of Hebrew, um, such as, let's say, um, Eliezer ben Yehuda. Um, and so the interesting thing is that Zamenhof went in a very different direction. Instead of like kind of embracing either the, the sort of territorial one language, one nation solution that the early Zionists uh, promoted, um, or the kind of non-territorial um, Yiddishist stance, which it looked like he could have gone in either of those directions, which is which is generally what happened to um, you know kind of Jews who are sort of politically and linguistically active in this period in Eastern Europe. He actually kind of um, took a, a different road, and um, his experience of anti-Semitism and of you know kind of ethnic strife led him to conclude that what people really needed was a universal language that would unite everyone, and he thought that this is kind of what would um, solve the problem of anti-Semitism and um, and you know eth ethnic um, prejudice. So um, this is what led him to create um, Esperanto. So it's really actually kind of rooted in a very very common. Um, commonly discussed um, issue among Jews, which was, you know, like kind of how to solve the problem of anti-Semitism. And his solution is just very different from the ones that we normally associate with, um, with Jews in this period. So um, he wanted the language to be very simple and very easy for anyone to learn. It only has um, 16 basic rules of grammar and no irregularities, which is something that you can do when you're creating your own language. Um, natural languages are not so, so, um, cooperative. Um, the vocabulary is based largely on Romance, Germanic, um, Romance and Germanic languages and on Greek, which makes sense because those are the languages that he studied that were seen to be as kind of, um, in, in, from a European's perspective, kind of high prestige and also sort of universal, um, particularly Latin and Greek. It doesn't have any explicit Jewish content, but there are some covert influences. Um, and a really interesting one is one that you can see here um, in, in the middle of the slide. Um, a trace of what can only be Yiddish in Esperanto, and it's the word superyaro, meaning leap year in Esperanto. Um, and so this comes from the Yiddish word iberyo, which uh, means leap year, and it's in, composed of two words, it's a compound. So the, the second part is yo, which is a Germanic word meaning year, uh, as in yolzeit, for example, um, anniversary of a death. And the first part, ibel, comes from, it's, it's from a Hebrew term, um, shnat ibu, uh, meaning leap year. Um, and because it sounds the same as a completely different word in Yiddish, um, Iber, which you can see if you can read the Hebrew script is spelled with an Aleph instead of an Ayn, um, there's this other word that sounds the same but has a completely different meaning of over. A lot of um, Yiddish speaking Jews thought that the word Iberyol meant over year. And even though it doesn't, it's from a completely different Hebrew root. It has nothing to do with the word for over, but it sounds the same. And so when he created this Esperanto word, superyaro, for leap year, it literally translates as over year. And there isn't any other language from the surrounding area that has the same, it's, it's basically a calc from the Yiddish um, based on this kind of misunderstanding of what the Yiddish means. So that's a very kind of clear, if specific Jewish influence on Esperanto. Um, and then um, as, after its creation, um, Esperanto retained its, its Jewish associations into the 20th century, so much so that in a negative way in the Nazi period, um, Hitler thought that Esperanto was part of a secret Jewish plot to the, rule the world, and Esperantists of all backgrounds, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, were persecuted. Um, and so we thought that even though you wouldn't kind of like typically see Esperanto in a, um, in a book on Jewish languages, we wanted to include it because we thought that it also has a really interesting um, Jewish perspective and a kind of, it's, it's part of the, the whole um, wider um, picture of the relationship between Jews and language, particularly in the, in the diaspora. 
Okay, so I think that that's the end of our um, formal <laughs> part of this Our presentation. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Aaron and Lily. Wow. Uh, I feel like we learned a lot about language, but we also learned so much more that language can really be a lens through which we can understand history, religion, culture. There's just so much richness there. So thank you. Um, so I want to start with a, a general question about your book. Would you say that, well, first of all, you wrote another book, which is this, or you edited this book, Handbook of Jewish Languages, and much bigger, right, and much more academic. And this one, it seems to be geared more toward a general audience. Who would you say is your intended audience for this book? Aaron, do you want to start? I think um, anybody with, with some small interest in language and Jewish history uh, will find this book interesting. We tried to make the book not technical, um, so that uh, people that don't have any kind of training will still be able to, to understand all of what we say. And some chapters uh, are more focused on little linguistic tidbits. Uh, some are more focused on historical or, or uh, literary uh, facts. So um, there's a real variety there. So we hope it'll be of interest to, to a wide audience um, as long as you have some interest in, in language and Jewish history. Would you agree, Lily? Yeah, I think we, we really had kind of at the forefront of our mind that we wanted it to be as accessible as possible. So um, really like kind of anyone we had in mind, you know, like kind of just anyone in the general general public who, who is interested, as Aaron said, in, um, in languages, in Jewish history, in minority languages, in language contact, um, or in, in really like kind of, you know, people who are interested in Jewish culture, but sort of told through the lens of language as opposed to, you know, like history or um, it, food or any of the other ways that you could like, kind of explore Jewish culture. Um, and we wanted um, students who are, you know, like kind of just first being introduced to um, Jewish studies and, and, you know, like maybe Hebrew or Yiddish to kind of be able to have an easy way of, um, of starting to learn about this, you know, much bigger world of Jewish languages that it, it can be very hard to get into if the only kind of, um, books that you have are, you know, kind of really technical and, and written primarily for professional linguists. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. Oh, sorry, Aaron, go ahead. So I just want to add, and each chapter has um, a guide to further reading, should somebody want to pursue uh, further research. And when we did our, our previous book, we found, and this book, with, with a lot of these languages and, and language varieties, there's just nothing out there for somebody who wants to learn more about, I don't know, Judeo-French or judeo Portuguese, there's, there's nothing out there, uh, at least not that's accessible to, to uh, the general reader. So we really tried to, to uh, provide a guide for uh, different kinds of readers. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with that. I'm going to be using it in my undergraduate class next semester. Great. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So the process of co-writing a book can be complicated. How was that for you? And how did you divide up the tasks? And, and then also, how did you go about doing your research? So shall I, I start and then sure. you'll add to it. So um, it was actually really fun. Um, so what we did, I'd say for the, the, for the first maybe half of the book is that we actually found it easiest to um, like to meet and work on it in person together. Um, and we would pick a language. So we, we kind of first drew up a list of languages that we thought we wanted to include. And we kept kind of adding to that and changing it. Um, and we started by writing um, chapters on a, a few of the languages that we, you know, kind of thought seemed um, just like kind of struck us as either something that we didn't know a lot about and we wanted to learn more about, um, like say Georgian. Um, and then we kind of alternate that with languages that we already, you know, knew a lot about like, um, Hebrew or Yiddish, actually, I think Hebrew came more towards the end by the time we completed it because it had a few different chapters, but some of the earlier chapters were on languages that were, you know, kind of quite straightforward to, um, to write about. Um, and it was really fun. We, uh, so we were like kind of working side by side for a lot of it and we would, um, you know, kind of take turns writing and then for other thing, other in, um, for other chapters, one of us would kind of like, you know, read sources, we would find sources and then like kind of discuss what we wanted to include and the other one would would like kind of, um, write up a draft and we would edit them together. So it was very much like we were both writing it together. Um, and then I'd say as it went on, and especially the last, but I guess we finished it 
we finished it right before lockdown, right? So we weren't actually affected by that. So we we did we did get to meet. I think that was because I went to Penn State to work on the um, the introduction and like kind of polishing it in February of 2020. So it was like <laughs> the last possible moment. Um, but we had started in the few months before that because we couldn't be in the same place um, to like kind of start writing chapters independently. So like one of us would write a draft of the chapter on like say Polish and then the other one would edit it and add to it. Um, so it was kind of a combination of, of like kind of really co-authored chapters and then chapters that one of us had like taken the lead on. Um, but I think we have uh, similar writing styles. So it, it, it sort of flowed. The hard part was the distance because she's in London and I'm in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a few weeks a year to meet and we really worked 12 hours a day. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, but, uh, and also the, the earlier edited volume that we did uh, really uh, gave us ideas. And of course we, we built on what a lot of other great scholars uh, had already discovered. Um, we do have some, some of our own discoveries, but a lot of what we, what we write in the book is, is based on discoveries of, of others, of other, uh, really good scholars. Um, but we, we would, the chapters that we have, uh, earlier handbook, there was some interesting tidbit and we decided to pursue that further. And we thought, you know, what would be the most interesting, um, uh, fact or perspective on any particular I mean, we, our book is is each chapter is only a, a couple thousand words in this new book so for languages like yiddish or ladino or arabic we we, we barely scratch the surface so we try, tried to choose uh in each case something that would really be the most interesting um uh aspect of that language or that language variety yeah, for some of them, like Malay or Zulu, you probably wrote everything that's known about that language right. in Hebrew, right? Right. but for most of them, you, you only have a, a very short intro. Uh, you you right. said you made some of your own discoveries. What were some of those? Um, I think uh, we found uh, some uh, manuscripts that were uh, uh, unknown or, or hardly known, you know, uh, that had been buried in libraries for a hundred years and, and um, or um, we found, uh, let's think, what was our- So one, really? this is like kind of a small example, but in the Hungarian chapter, um, everything that kind of was known about Hungarian that we'd seen written somewhere was about um, like Yiddish influence on contemporary Hungarian. Um, and, and just kind of by chance, um, because I'm, I'm working on another project about Hasidic Yiddish, um, one of my um, research associates, um, who, who is an ex Hasid from a visionist background, had, had this um, um, like book of Zmiris. Yes, <laughs> um, like a contemporary visionist, visionist book of, um, of, you know, like um, Shabbos table songs. Um, and one of them is this um, song that Sarah is showing, which we included in the book. Um, and, and it's a Hungarian folk tale. It was like a love song that was kind of adapted into a Yiddish version, uh, a, sorry, a Jewish version in Hungarian, but written in Hebrew script. Um, and so that was kind of exciting because this, this hadn't like this Judeo-Hungarian, like Hungarian in, in Hebrew script hadn't been documented. And it was obviously something that people knew about, but people inside the community, it wasn't something that academics had been writing about as far as we know. So that was like kind of, um, I guess a, a small example of something um, that, you know, kind of we, we hadn't known even to look for before. It just, you know, kind of over the course of writing the book, we, we discovered it, like we found out that it was there. And I should add Sarah's uh, holding the book up reminded me that in the book we have, I think about close to 50 uh, color photos, full page photos of manuscripts, many of which had never been published before. So even just to, um, if you don't read the book, it's a nice book to flip through and look at all these different uh, um, manuscript and printed book varieties in these various languages. Yeah, someone just asked in the chat if this is being recorded. And yes, I, I will post it on the Jewish language website. Uh, I'll post that link later. Um, but just to give another example of a, a cool find, uh, this is the Jewish English section. And I actually just cited this in a paper that I wrote about um, writing, writing systems in Jewish English. This is Jewish English in Hebrew letters, which is pretty rare in Jewish English. Uh, one is from the Gospel of Matthew, 
uh, from a missionary text. And another one is the British National Anthem <laughs> um, in, in Hebrew letters written in, in the orthographic system of Yiddish. So really, really helpful. Pull Thank that you up for... if you like. What? You want me to hold it up again? Uh, I, I can pull it up on the screen. Oh, you're going to pull it up. Okay, cool. I think if I can. Um, yeah, this, this um, we found a couple of uh, printed books in the in, um, British Library that are extremely rare. And um, there's this, let me see if I can figure this out. Um, does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you read Hebrew letters, you can try to, and you speak English, which I assume we all do, we can, you can try to work out what this says here. God save our gracious king. Long live yeah. our noble king. This is 1904, I think it was. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, what were some surprising facts that you learned through this process? Hmm. Um, I think we were amazed just, we thought we maybe we'd have about 30 different languages and we wound up discussing close to 50, 48, mm -hmm. I think it is. So we, we kept finding new manuscripts and, and um, uh, new texts. And uh, I think very close to the end, we found uh, this uh, within a uh, Judeo-Tajik text, uh, a, a lengthy passage in Uzbek written in Hebrew characters. Um, so in a few cases, we, we, we just kept finding more and I'm sure out there we haven't found yet. Yeah, I think that was definitely one of the more surprising things is, is how much there was. And also, I think the diversity of languages that were written in the Hebrew in the Hebrew script. Um, so like, you know, like, for example, there were the um, there was the Hungarian text and the um, the Chinese text and um, the Uzbek. And yeah, there, there were sort of many more examples of different languages that were written in the Hebrew script. Like we already knew that, that you know, it was used very widely, but I think I hadn't expected it to be used in so many different um, contexts. And even languages that were not traditionally written in the Hebrew script, like Georgian, Jewish Georgian, there's actually, it turns out that there's one text at least that we know of that was Georgian written in the Hebrew script. Um, so that was exciting. One of the most exotic ones that we discussed in the book is um, it's a, a short dictionary or short glossary um, printed around the year 1900. It, and it's a Yiddish um, Zulu, not, not quite Zulu, but a, a pigeonized variety of Zulu known as Fanagalo. And this book was published basically for, uh, yep, there's a, a, a picture of it. Uh, it was for uh, Jews living in South Africa to, to be able to communicate with uh, black either servants or or um, employees and uh, Zulu is a language that has clicks one of the famous click languages so we get to see how uh, some of these click sounds are represented in in Hebrew letters um, but in that chapter we talk about the history of, of the Jewish community in that region of South Africa. but uh, uh, that's probably the most exotic language that we discovered written in Hebrew script um, so yeah, a lot of surprises I think yeah, it seems like you guys really focused primarily on the writing system. Like, for example, you, you don't include chapters on Jewish Latin American Spanish or Jewish Swedish, which are uh, contemporary Jewish language varieties, but don't have the writing in Hebrew letters. Um, yeah. what, how did you decide on that, on that focus? We, yeah. We talked, oh, sorry, go on. We, 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 we included the... Uh, some brief discussion of Latin American Spanish in the Ladino chapter. Uh, there are all varieties of Spanish, but I think in that case we felt that um, we didn't have enough new to, to add, and we didn't. We, we, there's a very nice chapter on Latin American Spanish in our earlier handbook, and and um, we didn't have enough new material uh, to to. Um, New chapter. Would you agree, Lily, with that? Yeah. So I think we kind of we really wanted to make people aware of all of these language varieties existing, but there were some like Judeo uh, Jewish Swedish is another good example where we actually discussed having a chapter on that, um, and also on Jewish Finnish because there is like a kind of similar, not not the same, but a a kind of similar process where um, Jews in Finland actually 
first they spoke Yiddish, then they switched over to Swedish, and then later they switched over to Finnish. And there are some like kind of specific Jewish features um, of, of their Finnish, but we felt like in both cases that they're, and then we thought about having a chapter together on like Jewish, Jewish, Swedish and Finnish because they, they kind of, the Jews in Finland spoke Swedish for such a long time that it's kind of closely related. And we sort of felt like in the end that we wanted each chapter to have something like kind of really, um, you know, sort of singular, either, either an interesting text or a, a, like kind of really interesting and unusual historical development or something interesting in the language linguistically. And we felt like for Finnish and Swedish that we kind of couldn't, we couldn't think of a way to do it where it wouldn't just be kind of like telling a brief history of the Jews of Sweden or the Jews of Finland, um, because there, there kind of wasn't enough like linguistic material or, or textual material that we felt like we could add in that would be like showing something different from what you get in any of the other chapters. So we kind of settled kind of like with Latin American Jewish Spanish, we sort of settled for mentioning them in another chapter. I think we mentioned Swedish and Dutch in the chapter on Judeo-German, German, right? German, yeah. So yeah, so because, Dutch is another one, French, modern French is another one. Yeah, so for modern French, because we had this chapter on on like Judeo-French, medieval Judeo-French, we mentioned at the end about how like Jews still speak French in the modern period and that that has um, undergone, you know, like that there are some features of French, particularly in Israel and, and referred to the entry in your book, in your edited volume about um, French, in Israel, I think so. There were a couple of cases where we, um, where we we felt like we couldn't sort of get a whole chapter out of it without being too repetitive. But we did want to mention it so that if somebody wanted to know more about these varieties, that they could go somewhere else. Um, so that was really, I think, the the criterion that we used rather than whether they were written in the Hebrew script or not, because there are some language varieties like Georgian that have a really interesting history, even though they weren't usually written in the Hebrew script. Okay. Thanks. Well, if we if we want to look at Jewish engagement with many languages, we can also look at the book by uh, Murray Spiegel, who's with us today, called oh. 300 Ways to Ask the Four Questions, which has the four <laughs> questions in 300 different languages. So oh, he's getting yeah. up there, Murray. Okay. Um, so let's open it up to our audience. I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves and um, feel free to either put a question in the chat or to uh, just uh, raise your hand. Well, I can't really see everyone all. Oh, here, let me let me switch my view so I can see everybody. Okay. Uh, I think I can see most people, everyone who has their cameras on at least. So feel free to raise your hand. Oh, Alex is raising his hand. Go ahead, Alex. Yes, hi, this is a, I really enjoyed this talk. I especially love the factoid about pizza. Did you look at all at a language that has long fascinated me? I think it's referred to as Scots Yiddish. That was the sort of merger of lowland Scots and Yiddish. And did, did you look at that? Do we have any evidence of what it sounded like? No, um, I do know of somebody, I think that there was a student at one point in, in my department at UCL who was interested in, in Yiddish in Scotland. Um, and I don't know anything about it other than that it's, it's Yiddish and then it like kind of had, it took on influences from um, Scottish English, I think. Um, and I don't know of anything written about it. Does either of you, Sarah, Aaron, do you know anything about that? The Scots Yiddish? No. Um, I, I can check with my colleague because I, like I do know of it, but I don't know anything about it other than I think we didn't, I guess, include it because in my mind, it's more a variety of Yiddish. Um, and, and, you know, like we had chapters on Yiddish, but Yiddish was such a huge subject that we couldn't possibly cover everything related to Yiddish. Um, so I do know that it exists, but I don't know much more about it other than I think it's Yiddish with like with influence from Scottish English and like possibly some Gaelic vocabulary or Scots vocabulary. Yeah, you could probably have a similar book on Yiddish around the world, right? Because yes, <laughs> oh, <Yiddish is> so <laughs> that would be fun. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, and, you know, it seems like you guys are so productive. I wouldn't be surprised if that one came out next year. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Sarah has a question. Sarah Spivak. Hi. Uh, I've also really enjoyed this talk. I was curious uh, in regards to. A created language if you addressed the creation of theater Yiddish, uh, which my teacher, who's also in attendance, has described as being a medium between all the pronunciations of Yiddish, so nobody's happy? <laughs> um, no, not specifically, just because, like we said, Yiddish is such a huge topic that it could have its own book. So really for Yiddish, we had one chapter on like kind of old and early modern Yiddish. Um, so, so things like um, the, you know, the origins of Yiddish and um, 
early texts like um, the Bovobuch, um, which you know is kind of a classic epic of of um, old Yiddish literature, and then um, early modern Yiddish like the the Tzenerene and um, Glickel of Hamel, the the memoirs of Glickel of Hamel, and there are some letters, really interesting letters. Um, between a mother and a son from the Geniza, the Cairo Geniza in Yiddish. So we talked about some of those things to give a picture of old Yiddish. And then we have a chapter on like contemporary Kalal Yiddish, Tanvo Yiddish, and then a, a chapter on contemporary Hasidic Yiddish. But for the um, for the Yivli Yiddish chapter, which is like kind of where the the bulk of Yiddish theater, well, outside of, of um, the Hasidic world comes from, there was just too much. So we kind of gave an overview, but we couldn't go into a lot of detail. So Thank there's you. A, question, a private question in the chat. Um, David asks, I'm curious to know how many of the languages are still spoken by a native or a diaspora population? Hmm. Do you guys address the issue of vitality in the book at all? Yeah, uh, for the um, languages that are still around, uh, we have some brief discussion of of, uh, of how um, how they're faring in the modern world. Um, I, don't, I don't have a number, Lily. Do you? Um, I think in so it's like kind of at the end of every chapter, um, we we kind of if we could access numbers, we would we would give numbers. Yeah. Like in some cases, they're only like you know I don't know fewer than a hundred known speakers left or something, and so we would always mention them if we could find. Um, numbers um, and in a lot of cases, like obviously the, the languages are, you know, kind of either moribund or or have died out. But then there are other languages, um, like like Jewish English, which which Sarah is, um, you know, specializes in, among other things, that are actually kind of growing um, or you know have quite big speaker populations. Um, but it's kind of done on a chapter by chapter basis. Oh, Miri has an interesting question. What is your definition of language? Language. <laughs> well, I think I think in like when you're saying you know there are the these languages. languages or you've also used the term language variety. So yeah. how are you distinguishing between those? So for the most part, we mean language variety. So in a lot of cases, or it's most cases, apart from like say Yiddish and Ladino and you know like a couple of other um, um, cases where they can really be considered a separate language that's mutually unintelligible from the closest non-Jewish sister variety or, you know, kind of closest relative. Um, they really are just language varieties. So we're kind of quite careful not to say that there are separate languages. In a lot of cases, it's just, they're mutually intelligible. It's just that they have interesting features either of grammar or pronunciation um, or um, it, it, like one thing that they pretty much all have in common is some Hebrew and, and possibly Aramaic vocabulary. Uh, but yeah, so there's, I mean, there's the, the, the definition that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy, um, but I mean, even, even more so than that, like they're not all necessarily even dialects. Some of them are even, you know, they're kind of more, I, I would say less less separate than dialects, um, but it is quite a fuzzy picture as always, because many times there are non-linguistic factors that come into it. Do you, Aaron, do you want to? Yeah, well, and we talk about some of these issues in, in the chapters in our book, and we talk about which languages, uh, which Jewish languages really are essentially the same as the non-Jewish sister varieties, just maybe written in Hebrew script or have a few uh, differences in vocabulary. But really that, that question didn't concern us. The exact definition didn't concern us. Um, we, whether or not you call something a, a dialect or a language or, or, or an accent um, doesn't um, take away from all the, the interesting stories that go, that, uh, and the texts that go along with these languages. <laughs> I like that. I, I agree. When people ask me how many Jewish languages are there, I say it depends how you define a language. And even mm -hmm. if you're talking about one named language like Yiddish, some varieties of Yiddish might be not mutually intelligible with other varieties of Yiddish. So it really depends. And it's, it's just such a hard question yeah. to answer. Uh, let's go to Avramala, who has his hand up. Uh, can you unmute, Avramla? We can't hear you. Yeah, I wanted to know if, there's a, if there was some sort of dynamic between the, or a contradiction between the development of these languages, these localized languages, and the development of Yiddish. Did they develop side by side, or one was pulling toward away from one the other, or something of that nature? 
Do, do you mean uh, do other languages have similar developments like like Yiddish? Is that what you mean? Oh, were, they were they developing at the same time, or did they develop separately uh, at different times? For example, the one the provincial, for example, isn't so far from the Strasbourg area of uh, France. Uh, were they developed? It was Yiddish developing there, and this uh, provincial. Judeo-Provencial de developing at the same time, or, or were they completely separate developments? Um, I would say in most cases, separate developments. And really, the, uh, the languages that we talk about come from different time periods. So some of them, uh, we have evidence only from the medieval period, some only from a more modern uh, period. Um, some, like... Uh, uh, Aramaic and some of the varieties of Hebrew only uh, earlier. So uh, in many cases, the languages are, are uh, um, uh, developing simultaneously in different, different places, yes. But the text, the evidence that we have comes from different time periods also. Mm -hmm. Well, I say, yeah, in most cases, they're developing in different places. So like the, the Provencal speaking area never really overlapped with the early Yiddish speaking area, um, as, like, as far as we can tell. The Provencal was like kind of further south and east. It wasn't in the same part of, of France. So if Yiddish was spoken in the early period in northern France, it wouldn't have been like directly overlapping. Um, there, I mean, there might have been some like periods where say in the like kind of um, the first centuries when Jews were moving into the Slavic speaking regions of Eastern Europe, there might have been or probably were Slavic speaking Jews that were already living there. Um, and then gradually those speakers kind of got absorbed by Yiddish speakers, which became a much bigger population. And, and, and so you ended up really with Yiddish being the dominant or pretty much only Jewish language in those areas. Um, and that's why there isn't anything later from like say, um, I don't know, like we don't have like say Judeo-Romanian, for example, or like kind of very many examples of, of like Jewish Slavic languages because Yiddish had become the dominant language in that area, but there might have been Jews in, in, in those regions that were speaking a variety of, of, you know, some of obviously Romanian isn't Slavic, but um, in the primarily Slavic speaking region earlier, but generally they, there weren't like two different Jewish languages that were coexisting in the same place at the same time, I would say, apart from Hebrew and, uh, vernacular usually not but but in some cases we, we have uh, uh judeo-spanish and judeo-italian uh, in mm -hmm. italy Yiddish in italy or Greek and ladino in, in the ottoman empire and judeo-turkish so there, that's there's, true there's overlap as well and generally uh, that but i think generally that would happen when there is immigration so like for example correct. you had, had judeo-greek speakers or Judeo-Italian speakers, and then there was an influx of Judeo-Spanish speakers after the expulsion from Spain. So you, you would get these, these situations, and then sometimes they would be in contact with each other, but they were like separate Jewish communities that maybe later merged. Uh, so I am gonna put in the chat a link to um, a list of statistics on contemporary number of speakers of various right. Jewish languages, language Thanks. varieties. Um, and then there is a question from Martin. Martin. Go ahead. Uh, I gather that this was not the main focus of your research, but as you were compiling the data, did you develop any unifying theory as to why uh, various Jewish languages appear? Was there a, a social or an economic benefit in each of these communities? And was there any rabbinic input, you know, favoring the use of the Hebrew alphabet Who would like to start? Natalie. Okay, so I guess I would say that in, in many cases, it's um, something to do with the history of that particular Jewish community. So either because of something like say in the case of, um, of Ladino, um, I mean, and, and this isn't something that we came up with. This is, I think, you know, like Sarah has written about this and, and this is kind of well established that when, when a Jewish community um, either was expelled or, or migrated for some other reason that they took their language with them and in some cases, like the case of Yiddish and, and Ladino, that the language kind of evolved separately after they had left the, the place where they had first started adopting the language. So, you know, like Ladino and the Ottoman Empire preserved some archaic features of, of Castilian Spanish and then that, that kind of were lost or changed in Spain and in Latin America. And then it also um, adopted, you know, like um, Greek and Turkish elements uh, or um, Southern Slavic elements. So there was a kind of historical circumstance that just kind of ended up in, in um, this, this language, like kind of having different features. Um, 
and the same happened with Yiddish, but these are kind of outliers because in most cases, the Jewish languages were spoken in the same area as the like non-Jewish sister language. And so in, in that case, it's really a lot of times just because the communities were separate. So Erin can talk more about um, Judeo-Italian, but you know, like if there were ghettos or if the Jewish quarter was separate, people, you know, kind of just naturally will start speaking slightly differently or they will preserve archaic features um, that, that reflect an earlier migration. Um, and so I think that accounts for a lot of it. It's not, it's not really anything that was kind of by design, um, but it kind of reflects the history of the communities. And then the use of the Hebrew alphabet, I think really is just reflects the fact that this is the alphabet that Jews were most comfortable in. And that's the language that, that's the alphabet that they learned to write in from at least, at least boys from when they were three years old. Um, and, and, you know, that was the first language that, the, the, sorry, the first alphabet that was familiar to them. And so it was quite natural for them to write their vernacular in it as well. Um, right, Jews weren't part of the education system of the European Christian education system or the, or the Arabic mm -hmm. education system in, in many places. So uh, they had their own schools. And so Hebrew is what they, what they learned to write. Um, yeah, and uh, in contemporary Jewish communities, they do have... Some, sometimes they Jews do still have separate educational systems, but have requirements in the countries that they live in that they have to attain literacy in the local language. And so that really explains why most contemporary Jewish language varieties are not written in Hebrew letters. Mm -hmm. And actually like just a, kind of a, a small point on the back of um, for this uh, project that I'm working on about contemporary Hasidic Yiddish, um, we, um, give questionnaires to our participants who are native, uh, native speakers of Hasidic Yiddish from different communities. And like, interestingly, um, in New York, we did a lot of quite a bit of field work in New York. Um, and in so for the New York speakers, um, when we have a questionnaire that they have to translate into Yiddish, we, we had a modern Hebrew version and an English version. And we would say, which one would you prefer? And most of the New York speakers, especially the men, pretty much all said that they wanted the Hebrew version. And that wasn't necessarily because their modern Hebrew was like really fluent. It was because they found it more comfortable. It was easier for them to read the Hebrew version, despite the fact that they've grown up in New York. So it still does continue in, in some, you know, like very traditional circles. But to this day, people are just more comfortable reading the Hebrew script. And that's how it always was, you know, kind of it, up until the modern period. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Let's go with Murray. So, hi everybody. In uh, taking this in taking this topic to uh, a non-specialist audience, what did you think was the most important things to uh, emphasize to hook the gen the general audience? Good question. <laughs> I I would say just the sheer diversity of languages that Jews have used uh, both for speech and for writing, um, and the amount of material out there would surprise. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Lily? Yeah, I'd say it kind of really varies from language to language because we had a lot of discussions like what, what's the most exciting thing to tell about this language or this language variety? Um, and in each case, we, we kind of tried to approach it differently so that in some cases, there is something really interesting um, to do with the language itself and like say how it's different from like say how Ladino is different from Spanish because we thought probably a lot of people reading the book, especially in North America, are familiar with Spanish, at least to some extent. So it would be interesting to see that, you know, like, well, in, in, in Spanish, it's, it's pienso, but in Ladino, it's penso, or, you know, like that they're different, um, like the verb paradigms are different because that's something people might be able to relate to. Um, whereas for another language, um, like say Georgian, it's not really going to be relevant to hardly anyone unless they speak Georgian, um, you know, like about the differences between um, Jewish Georgian and like, you know, non-Jewish Georgian varieties, whereas it's interesting the fact that there's this very, very long history and that Jews have been speaking Georgian, which is, you know, kind of a very, um, it's a language from a very unfamiliar language family um, and, you know, that they have this kind of like long history of speaking this language, but not writing it like there. Are, so for each one, there was a slightly different angle that we hope is something that would be engaging to the general reader. Okay, well, uh, we are just about out of time. Are there any final comments from Aaron or Lily? No, thank you, Sarah, for organizing this and thank yeah. you everybody for coming um, on a Sunday. And if you, I, 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 if you have more questions, you can find our emails uh, and, and we'll be happy to, um, to answer more questions if, if you have them. Yeah.
Yeah, and if any of you, oh, Lily, go ahead. I was Sorry. just going to say again, yeah, thank you to everyone for coming and thanks, Sarah, for organizing it. Yeah, sure. And um, as I posted in the chat, I will be posting the recording of this session on our events page. And if any of you have ideas for other Jewish language programs that you'd like to see, feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat. And um, I want to thank you for your interest in Jewish languages and for attending this session. And I do recommend that you purchase the book. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank everyone. You.